Welcome to Means of Grace, a podcast produced by the Western North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. We serve a God who stepped down from glory to be with us. Now it's our job to leave the walls of our church and do likewise. Our guests today share their experience in that work through the means of asset-based community development and community organizing as similar ways to connect disciples with the needs of the community in order to create change. But before we hear from our guests, we at the leadership development team would like to invite you to the Leadership Engagement Live webinar series, where you can connect with one another in ministry, imagine what your future is and could be in the United Methodist Church, and engage in missions and ministries that can better our world. Each webinar provides an opportunity to learn from and engage with the hard work and experiences of clergy in the Western North Carolina Conference. So we invite you to take part in one or all three webinars in this series. Each webinar will be from noon to 1 p.m. and registration is already open and linked in the show notes. Now, without further ado, here's our conversation on connecting with others, changing the community. Welcome to the Means of Grace podcast. I'm Jesse Innes, Director of Communications for the Leadership Development Team. And I'm Kim Ingram, and I work in ministerial services for the annual conference. And we are joined today by the Western North Carolina clergy, Dr. Heather Kilborn and Dr. Kathy Davis. Heather is the Director of Faith and Rural Communities at the North Carolina Rural Center. Prior to that, she served churches in Statesville, Morganton, and Yankinville. Kathy is the pastor of Mount Zion United Methodist Church in Piney Creek, up in the mountains. Prior to that, she served in Western North Carolina in Gastonia, Mount Airy, Meisenheimer, Yadkinville, Winston-Salem, and Ashe County. You've been all over parts of the annual conference. But in the middle of that service time, Kathy spent time in the Oregon-Idaho conference and brings experience from a completely different part of the country to our conversation today. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Our focus today is on specific ways leaders can engage the church in their communities. Each of them has completed a DMIN, and Kathy has some additional training upon which they will draw in order to help others connect with their learning. So let's start with you, Heather. Tell us why you chose to pursue a DMIN in the first place. Hi, Jesse. Thank you for, for asking that, because it's one of my personal God sightings. I was told by someone that it's not time to start your DMIN until you have a question of ministry that has gotten a hold of you and, and just won't let go. So back in the spring of 2017, I, I started moving in that direction and started an online application at Candler School of Theology at Emory University. And I just wasn't sure if it was the right time. And it happened to be a new program. First, the, the deadline was moved from April to May, and then I didn't finish the application. And then June came around and, and the director of the DMIN program there, Brent Strawn, who's now at Duke Divinity, emailed me and said, interested in your application, will you please complete it? So I called a family member who was really good at calling me out on my excuses. And I was like, I don't know what to do. Like, is this the right time? Should I start this DMIN program? And my family member said, you remember that story about the man who was in the middle of a flood and prayed to God to save him. And then God sent a boat and the man said, no, 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 I'm not getting in the boat. God's going to save me. God sent him a helicopter and he said, no, 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 I'm not going to get in the helicopter. God is going to save me. And then the man died. He drowned and got to heaven and, and asked God, why didn't you save me? And, and God said, I tried. I sent the boat. I sent the helicopter and, and, and you didn't get in. And my family member said, well, Heather, thank God is sending you a helicopter and, and it's up to you. Are you going to get in 
or are you not? And and so that sort of led me on the journey through my ID man. And the question that got a hold of me that just would not let go of me was how do we create asset-based community development models for the rural church? That led me on this journey, changed my vocational path and led me to going into extension ministry, led me to start a program on asset-based community development in the rural church and, and really changed my ministry. So I'll, I'll have to tell you, Jesse, I'm, I'm glad I got into that helicopter. We're glad that you did too. Absolutely. So can you tell us a little bit more about uh, what ABCD is, Asset-Based Community Development? Sure. Asset-Based Community Development was started in the late 80s by a gentleman named John McKnight and Jody Kretzman at Northwestern University. But I would argue that ABCD was actually used by John Wesley and, and probably started by Moses in, in Exodus is, is the argument I would make. But everybody other than me sees it as starting in the late 80s. And asset-based community development is probably best understood by what it's not. So prior to that, nonprofits, government agencies would go into a low-income urban neighborhood and say, what does this community need? and would look at what are the deficits. And then they would say, we're gonna come into this community with a brand new program and we're gonna fix all these deficits. McKnight and Kretzman with ABCD changed that conversation. And what they did instead is they went into these communities and said, what is going right? What is going well? What can we build on? And you look around any community and you're gonna see something going well. To sort of help drive this home, to use an example, you know, instead of going in a community and, and perhaps seeing a high unemployment rate, go into that community and see how many small businesses are thriving. Go into that community and, and see these people with entrepreneurial spirits who have a side hustle where they're making extra money on the side. See what is going well in that community and, and then join in and see how you can help build on that. So ABCD is, is a way of building capacity in communities and, and helping people to thrive by building on what's going right, as opposed to our tendency to look at the needs and what's going wrong. And, and if we're really honest with ourselves, the church can be guilty of that too, of looking at our neighbors and, and seeing their needs and, and seeing what is going wrong as, as opposed to looking and seeing what's going well and how we can join in. Well, personally, I am excited about this conversation because I, I've been going down that wrong road and you've just corrected me. And so I'm, I'm very excited to hear more about this. And you mentioned that you would actually tie the beginnings of this to John Wesley or even further. So can you explain a little bit more about that connection with John Wesley and his ministry in the 18th century England and in rural areas of North Carolina. Can you make that connection for us? That's a great question. Ecclesiastes tells us that there is nothing new under the sun. And that is, is so true. So this idea of asset-based community development and, and an extension of that community development in general is sort of seen as this late 20th century idea that emerged, but John Wesley was already doing it. John Wesley was a very practical theologian. He was watching very closely what was happening around him at his time in, in England. At this time, there was a huge switch in cultures, meaning that people were leaving the country and being subsistence farmers. And in England, they were moving into the towns and the cities and, and working in mines, working in industry. So there was this huge shift in that society. And, and John Wesley just stepped right into that and, and saw the needs of the people that he was serving with and developed programs to respond to those. One really exciting example is that John Wesley was doing micro lending micro lending in the 18th century. Like I thought micro lending was something invented in the 20th century in international context. Also at, at that time in England, 
there was a huge problem with debt, not unlike America today, but in England at that time, you could go to prison if your FICO score was low enough. And John Wesley saw that problem. And John Wesley started a credit union. You know, it wasn't called a credit union, but he started a credit union and was giving loans to help people pay their debts in order to avoid prison. All of this was going on 250 years ago. And and there's so many other examples. Wesley was working on adult illiteracy rates by teaching people to read. He was building housing for orphans and widows. In fact, John Wesley was even doing the 18th century of universal health care in that he wrote a book on home remedies and, and how you could treat yourself at home during a time when there were not doctors and, and people could not afford to get medical help. All these examples really excite me. And I really see community development and John Wesley's version of asset-based community development as a part of our DNA as United Methodist. That's one of the many reasons that, that I love being a United Methodist, because from the very beginning, our churches and church leaders were looking into the community and, and trying to find ways to partner in the community. Love that. I love all, all of those like really cool John Wesley connections. Can you tell us a story about how ABCD has been utilized by a faith leader in, in a community? Oh, yeah, definitely. Currently, I, I work under a Duke Endowment funded program called Faith in Rural Communities. And we go into rural communities and work with church teens to apply asset based community development to their missional engagement projects. And so, an example of this a, a lot of churches have food pantries or they're supporting a food pantry in their community. And so, we're trying to help the churches to ask the question, why are people hungry? You know, it is important to feed people, but why are people hungry? And I'm working with some churches now on a really big question. And so they're asking the big question of, why are young people in our community using drugs? And and the answers that they're finding has very little to do with drugs. It comes back to economic development, mental illness, isolation, young people not feeling that they have any hope. And let's just stop and put on our asset-based community development cap. What part of our communities are really good at building connections and relationships and are excellent at offering hope for people? Our churches, right? I mean, that is what we're really good at. So what does it look like for a church to step into that space and help to prevent drug abuse in their communities? And and if you allow me, I'd love to share just, you know, one more example of of churches using asset-based community development. And and I chose this example because I wanted to, to use a small church so that people don't think that this is just something that large churches or urban churches can do, but the very small rural churches actually do it very well. It's already in their skill set. And I'll have to say, I chose the example of Piney Creek. And I, I just learned this morning that Kathy is in Piney Creek. For those of you who don't know, Piney Creek is in Allegheny County up in the northeastern part of the state, close to the Virginia line. We're discovering today that Piney Creek is the center of the universe. So what they're doing in Piney Creek with asset-based community development is They don't have a lot of jobs. Their jobs are limited really to the Christmas tree industry. And they have a problem called the brain drain. And that means that young people in rural communities have to move to Charlotte or Raleigh or to larger towns to find jobs. So this church was concerned about that and really wanted to look at how can we have an impact in this space. So they started a scholarship fund for high school graduates who are specifically interested in a trade skill, and and that means plumbing, electrical work, HVAC technician, childcare, and the scholarship supports all those additional costs beyond tuition 
that really trips some young people up when they're trying to go to a community college, meaning that they support the gas money to drive across the county line to the closest community college. They support child care. If you have young children, the scholarship can support auto maintenance or books or supplies, you know, all those additional costs that comes with going to a community college. And, and I believe if John Wesley, you know, could see what was going on there in Allegheny County, my belief is that he would be so proud. I mean, this this is what Wesley was trying to do in his England. And, and this is what we're trying to do in our communities. Heather, I love that because what you're really saying is that we can draw on our past and our history to know about how we do ministry, that there aren't necessarily new ways of doing ministry. We just need to identify our context and then the tools that help us to engage in relevant ways. Kathy, I want to talk to you a little bit about your dissertation and some of the learning that you've done. Your dissertation for your DMIN related to holiness of heart and light for the life for the 21st century. And of course, holiness of heart and life is very Wesleyan. And of course, it's biblical. And I wonder why you sensed a need at the time that you did it to do a deeper dive in this area. And I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit more about your DMIN program. You used some big words when you described it to me that I wasn't familiar with. So I decided not to try to do that, but let you do it for us. (laughs) Like Heather, I was in a time in my life where I was struggling with a big question that wouldn't let go. And for me, the question was, Why is the church so inward focused? Why is the pastor the sage on the stage? Why aren't leaders stepping up to do ministry in their own space? And why aren't we going out into the world? Because that's what we were commanded, go into the world. So I was struggling with that. And I had visited Oregon a couple times and with my daughter living there, I, I really was just wanting to learn more about what church in the postmodern age would look like. And of course, nobody really knows that, but I got to study at George Fox Evangelical Seminary, and I thought this was really great because I did my MDiv at Hood Seminary, which is AME Zion. I grew up as a Methodist, and I did my D-Men at George Fox, which is Quaker. <laughs> so I've had a gamut of experience in different religions in the, in the country. But I got to study under Dr. Leonard Sweet. And he taught us about semiotics. That's that big word. And I was just blown away. Semiotics is about how we see the signs of change all around us and how to interpret those signs for the church. And so as I thought about what to do for my DMIN program or my dissertation, this idea of holiness of of heart and life from Wesley is so full of symbols and signs for how to develop a strong life of faith and then how to share it with others. It was kind of Wesley's grace in in the pocket, kind of take it out, do these things and They were symbols and signs all around. So I thought that if we if we start with the sign, the means of grace in the holiness of heart and life, these means of grace were just so full of those signs and symbols. So I thought that maybe studying this kind of thing would be where it would lead me. And I was just torn open. They say that your MDiv takes your faith and throws it in the air and then it scatters all around you and you have to put it back together. Well, the DMN did that for me as well in the way that I think about what church should be. Because if we start with means of grace, then the top-down understanding of leadership, this idea of attracting people to come into our church, that all dissolves. (laughs) It just goes away. And so means of grace for me were those things that Wesley new were experience-based and involved participation and connected people to one another. So that's kind of where I went with my DMIN program. Thank you for sharing that, Kathy. And then you went on to do, at some point later after that, some training in community organizing. 
And I can see how, and, and, and I would, would like you to talk about that, but also talk about how that connects to what you learned and experienced in your dissertation, because I can see there could be a really significant connection and impact between those two things. Will you tell us more about it? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Thank you for asking. Heather and I are almost totally on the same page. She said some things that I was like, oh, this is this is what I was going to say. The ABCD form of looking at the hopefulness and and seeing what they are doing right. Community organizing training that I got, which community organizing is short for when people who live in a certain area come together to dive into what's happening in their community, to look at the why. Heather mentioned that a while ago to really get into the why. Why is this problem happening? And what resources do we have that we can use and build upon? And sometimes the why comes hard. It doesn't come very easy. And things sometimes get solved. But in in my work, I've noticed that in other times, it morphs into a whole nother issue. And I was trained by the IAF, the Industrial Areas Foundation, which was one of the first union organizers in the in the United States. So we do look at the why and what we can do to help people's lives be better. Does that answer your question? (laughs) It does. So then how do you connect that to discipleship? How do you connect that to holiness of heart and life? Or maybe what is the usefulness of community organizing? in a community of faith or, or by a, a church of some sort? For me, it starts with the word go. So I'll give you the example of a story that I use that I had talked about, wanted to talk about anyway, a story about how I use community organizing in one church in particular. There had been a rash of suicides in our town. And, and when I say town, this was a, a town of 22,000. Uh, southeast of Portland, Oregon. And everybody was sad. It was all everybody was talking about. It was mostly young adults and it was mostly overdoses. And I had formed a relationship with a city council member. This is part of community organizing as well, who was also working for the Ford Family Foundation in Oregon. And so I, I was meeting her for lunch one day and we sitting there talking about this. And we just looked at each other and was like, well, we have to do more than thoughts and prayers. We have to do more than thoughts and prayers. We decided to call together the community. And so I posed it to my church and I had probably five or six people step up and say they wanted to be in on it. And we had a meeting and called together community. We put it out on every form of social media we could. And so when we first met, there was about 30 people in the room, and it was a variety of people. It was family members of those who had passed by suicide, the police department, people representing that, people just wanting to better the neighborhood, better the town. And so we got the papers out with the post-it note sticky on the back, and we started writing you know, why do we think this is happening in our town? And we just had small groups talking and then they came together and we wrote things down and we met for weeks, weeks upon weeks. And sometimes the group would would shrink and there'd only be six or seven people there. But we also, while we were doing that, the people that were meeting would go out into the community and discover things they didn't know, such as what social services had to offer. They talked about where suicide prevention training was being done or if it was being done. They had talks with the police department about how to connect community together. And it took over a year, but the focus kind of changed when we realized that For many people in the town, this one thing kept coming up every time we met, and it was that they felt unknown and uncared about. And these things you mentioned that Heather mentioned about isolation and decreased hope, and you mentioned it too, and not having connections. And here we were in a relatively small town in wine country, Oregon, and we thought, you know, 
our side of town or my side of town was doing great. We knew all our neighbors, but there were people that didn't. And so the short story is where we started out as a focus on suicide prevention morphed into something more. It's now called Nurturing Newburgh. And it's an organization funded under the Newburgh Education Foundation as a 501c3. So not only is their goal to suicide prevention starting in elementary schools, but helping neighbors get to know one another, providing resources to police departments and other groups with education about suicide prevention and more. And so it was started off as one thing, but changed. There's three people from the church still on the board of directors. Wow, that is so exciting. That is really neat how you took us through the journey of of how a need in a community really ultimately resulted in a resource and a community organization helping to meet that, what, what the determined needs were. Something I hear from both of you, two things. One is that partnerships in the community with other leaders and other people who relate to whatever the concerns and needs are or have an interest are vital. It's not just about the work the church does, but the church is one entity in the community that participates in in the work that's being done. And the other is that you kind of have to be in it, it sounds like, for the long haul, that it's not something that you're going to plan a program and next month you're going to do the program and then you check that off the list, but it's something that takes some time Kathy, I wonder if you would reflect on that for a minute. It does take time, and you do have to get out and meet the people in the community. Sometimes I think it's easier in a town or a city to do that because you're right there, and there's so many people that you need to meet. But in a rural place, it's a little bit more difficult, especially in a rural place like Piney Creek, and Heather knows this, there's a church on every corner. And I'm, there's not a lot of corners. There are more round roads, <laughs> deep dive roads. There, there's a church at least every mile, maybe every five for sure. So how do you get the voices of the people in the, in the community to the table? So it takes a little bit more intentionality. It takes a little bit more time and it is hard work, but it's definitely for me, It is living out our faith. It is this holiness of heart and life, not just for us. Religion has taken such an inward focus and this idea of personal salvation. I see salvation as communal. Jesus came to save the world, not just me. And so that's where the whole idea of how it how it goes together with the church. Whether the church participates a hundred percent or not, it's still living out our faith. That's so true. And in, in Matthew twenty eight nineteen, Jesus says to go and make disciples of all nations. And so, in order for us to do that, we have to be more engaged with our communities. And I appreciate you sharing that. And you each place a high priority on on this community engagement. What insights or advice would you have for other ministry leaders? And Heather. We'd like to start with you. I think it it summarizes a lot of what Kathy just shared. One, you need to be building partnerships, and and that's partnerships with other churches and nonprofits, but that's also partnerships with people. So expand your table so that people from the community are at the table and speaking. So if, if you have a passion to help with homelessness, do not try to help with homelessness without talking to someone who's unhoused and and really hearing their perspective. And you can apply that to any ministry that the church is trying to build. And I also would add, just for the smaller rural churches, don't try to be anything but what you are. So, So don't just copy what the big church down the town is doing or what the national mega church that you follow is doing. Look deeply at the gifts because God has given each church gifts. At the very least, all our rural churches have buildings, right? So look at the gifts that you have. Who are you? And then build on that as opposed to trying to be something that another church is. I did know that. And I also want to recommend a book that I'm going through with my church right now called People Over Property. It's one of the Fresh Expressions books 
by our bishop and Audrey Warren. And we are looking at our building to not do what somebody else has done, not a cookie cutter thing just to do ministry. That That's another thing churches have really gotten to this habit. We've got to do ministry. I don't like that terminology. Ministry is not something we have to do. It is something we should automatically just be in. And it's not something you do to someone. It's it's something you do with someone. And to me, that makes a, a whole difference in the approach. And that's where, for me, community organizing and asset-based organizing has been tremendously powerful in my ministry. So, Kathy, as you talk about what you're doing with your church, I wonder as you've done this, because it sounds like you've you've had this approach for a while and, and been in different churches where you've tried to apply it. How do you identify the people who have the shiny eyes? Like, how do you determine the people that might really want to get on board and be a part of this with you? Because you said, you know, it doesn't have to be everybody. It's not going to be everybody. So what what is the approach as the leader of a congregation figuring out who might want to take this journey with you? Do you have any advice around that? Boy, that's a good question. It's often someone who's already very involved in mission and has has a question also that, you know, I had one lady in the, the church I was in in Gastonia. She was in charge of the outreach. And she said, you know, we do a lot of collecting things. We do a lot of writing checks. We don't go and talk to people. So she was already in, you know, one of those with the shiny eyes. But I think it is first, I didn't do this the first year I came to my church in Newburgh. It was a couple of years in, really, before we really got into it. We even invited a guest speaker who was world-renowned in the education department of what nurturing meant to school children, how to nurture people. And, oh man, we probably had 150 people from the county, from the community come. All kinds of social workers and police officers and nurses and everybody teachers, a very good time to kind of go that focus about, you know, what we wanted to do. And you can do anything with this. Uh, You just have to, you have to work it. It's just hard. It's just a lot of work. Yeah, it sounds like a big commitment. It is a big commitment, but isn't Jesus a big commitment for us? I mean, aren't we committed everything? It's our job to go and Do likewise. That's beautiful. Thank you, Kathy. Heather, I know the organization you work with has resources that can be offered to churches. Would you tell us more about it? Yes, and and this is a very timely question. I work with faith and rural communities, and and we offer a program called Connect Church. And it's a nine-month coaching program that's offered through the Duke Endowment free to United Methodist Churches in both conferences, the North Carolina Conference, and the Western North Carolina Conference. And the church selects a team of, you know, five to seven people, and you choose those shiny-eyed people to be part of that team. And they expend that nine months of really exploring the assets in the church, the needs in the community, and, and building a strategic plan for their missional engagement work. So we're recruiting churches right now. So if, if someone is interested in more information, they can go to our website, which is ncrural, R-U-R-A-L, center.org, and they can get more information. And I'm also very excited that we're launching a new program that doesn't just work with one church, but works with four or five churches in an area that's going to look more of what Kathy was talking about as a community organizing model. And we are recruiting churches for that. That program is called Connect Community. And and we'd love to see some United Methodist churches build a coalition in their community and take the lead on addressing local challenges in an asset-based, relational, and strategic way. So we we would love to connect with any churches that are interested in more information. Well, those sound like great resources. And we'll put the website and the book that you mentioned, Kathy, and some other resources in the show notes so that people can access them easily. Wow. Thank you both. Dr. Kathy Davis, pastor of Mount Zion UMC in Piney Creek, and Dr. Heather Kilborn, director of Faith in Rural Communities. 
for the North Carolina Rural Center. I want to thank you both for this really great conversation that shows us the patterns of community engagement throughout our Wesleyan history. We've even been educated on things like semiotics, <laughs> if, if I'm pronouncing that right, <laughs> and uh, encouraging us to widen the table and to engage in those burning questions that won't just let go. Our communities, whether they're thriving or surviving, will be so enriched by your examples of acid-based community development and holiness of heart and life. And I'm also incredibly grateful for the Holy Spirit that so clearly brought us together today to share such an important message. So thank you both for for the time. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Jesse and Kim for inviting us. Thank you for listening to Means of Grace, a podcast produced by the Western North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. We hope you enjoy listening to these podcasts and use them as a way to stay connected to our community. Remember to subscribe to Means of Grace for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave us an honest rating and a review. It helps others find this podcast. Follow the WNCC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at WNCCUMC. Once again, that's at WNCCUMC. Means of Grace is produced by the Western North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church and Andy Goh of Gojo Studios. 